you glad that you live here? It's a wonderful place. I'd like to be in like a Minnesota right now. Oh. Stand sun shoveling out somewhere. Anyway, once again, I say this every Sunday, you only get tired of it, but during the summer, I don't say it. We had Shore here again last night. We had 10 homeless people here in our church. Yay. And we had uh, a couple, two couples come down here and cook them dinner. And, and then we had Ron who comes down here every morning and puts all the chairs back and everything like that. We just appreciate all the people that are doing that. Now, I want to say that there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm going to announce. And it all say, starts with a little volunteer. And you're like, oh, man, I don't want to do that. Do you realize, you know, I... I understand where you're coming from if you don't like to participate. When I first started going to church, I didn't participate in any of it. I just went on Sunday morning, went to the football game, actually NASCAR. <laughs> I'll probably watch it next week, but, um, you know, go home and drink beer or go water skiing or something. But I really didn't care much about volunteering, and I didn't participate in church. And I agree that participating in church is not what it's all about. What it is, if you do decide to volunteer and help out in any of the things that I mentioned here, you're actually giving yourself to the Lord. You're serving the Lord in what you're right. doing here. You're doing things for the Lord. It's kind of cool. So, and you're getting an opportunity. We talk about at the end of everything. It says building relationships that last forever. We say that every Sunday. Well, what's that mean? Well, if you don't know the guy sitting across the aisle from you, you've never met him, you really don't know him. And yet, if you work side by side with him, either cleaning the grounds or cooking for the homeless or something like that, you develop a relationship, and that's the relationship with each other, which is building relationships that last forever, because we're hoping they're going to see each other in eternity. As you build the relationship with them, you're building a relationship with the Lord, because you're serving the Lord. Kind of a cool deal. Sorry about taking your time, Stan. Anyway, <laughs> January 31st, next Sunday, no, next Saturday, before the Super Bowl. Is that what they call the Super Bowl? Anyway, there's going to be a hike, and the information is out there on the table. Our hikes are always a lot of fun. I said it was 10 miles last week, but it's only five miles this week. So it's five miles round the way. As they say it's five miles one way, but then they say it's not a 10 mile hike. So they confuse me, but it's a five mile hike. Anyway, there is a sign up out there for, and it says hospitality. So there is another volunteer thing. It means like once every month or two, that's all we're talking about, every once a month or two, one time you bring in something be served between services, you know, like cookies and cheese and stuff, and for old fat guys like me, health food, things like that. But anyways, sign up for that and help out. It's kind of a, it's kind of a nice thing, and somebody will call you and remind you when it's your time, hopefully. But the idea being that you're participating, and you're not always being the taker, you're a giver as well. So sign up for that. There's also a new thing coming out. It's uh, these little forms are on that table, and what it amounts to is in building our building fund, rather than trying to come to you for our money, uh, if you take your cans down to the recycle bin uh, down there on Clark Road, if you mention that you want a donation to go to Hope Church, you can. There's aluminum cans and bottles and stuff like that. So it's kind of a way that you can help without having to reach into your wallet. Anyway, there's also a sign up out there for church cleanup. That's the outside and inside. What that amounts to is that you'll be on the list, and if there's an event happening at a, a time when we're starting to notice that things need to be done, that somebody will call you and say, hey, if you're not busy for, for a couple of hours on a Saturday morning, can you come down here and help out? If you say, no, I can't this Saturday, no big thing. But if you can, then great. And then Stan always brings coffee and donuts and stuff like that. For us. And he pays for himself, which makes it even better. Okay. Uh, archery starts in February. The sign up for the information on that is on this wall rather than on the table. Did I tell you about the table? I mentioned it. It's a sign up table over there. There's a sign up table over there. Take a look at that. Anyway, on that sign up table also is information on our memorial garden. So if you have somebody that you want to honor that has passed away, it doesn't matter if they've never stepped foot in this church or that none of us know them. There's a form out there that you can fill out and there's an envelope that you put money in. Put that in there for regular collection and that person can handle it. It's all spelled out there. It's all on the table. It's a really good thing. People have done our memorial garden. I asked it again. Who hasn't been to our memorial garden? And I won't embarrass you this time. Who has not gone to the memorial garden? Mm -hmm. Only two of you. Well, I'm watching you now. 
<laughs> okay, I'm not going to embarrass you, but after the service, I'd like to see you walk around the back here and take a look around the inside. And it's open 24 hours a day, and it's the only bus stop that goes there. The only young man was going over there today and got distracted, but he's going to go. I'm afraid of him. Uh, we hate Americans still. Anyway, uh, anybody seen the American Sniper? I went and saw it, and I know a number of the people other than at this church have or have not seen it or gone to see it. But all I can say is there's not enough words in me to thank the, uh, every man and woman that yeah. has put on a uniform for this country. Yeah. And I thank you very much. <laughs> what now? <laughs> well, I saw it the other night, and I just couldn't contain myself because I thought of Rock the Ridge, so I stood up and said to the people in the audience afterwards, I said, well, if any of you believe what, we, what they're doing over there, come to Rock the Ridge on February 21st at the Vietnam Veterans. And have Rock the Ridge with them if you Rock the Ridge. I won't chastise you ever again. Uh, <laughs> the Rock the Ridge sign-ups out there and every dime that comes in from Rock the Ridge. For those of you that don't know or haven't been here during Rock the Ridge, we pay for it out of our church funds. It's free to everybody that comes through the door. Everybody. And they get meals and normally popcorn, but not this time. And fantastic concert. And it's free. And every and it's all done by contributions. People give contributions. And all of that money will go to the veterans this year. This, this Rock the Ridge. So please participate. Please sign up to help. And say hello to somebody.
God who created the universe. Our God provides us with everything that we need for each and every day. And though we may not understand the circumstances or the reason or the certainty or the purpose of what is happening, we can have faith and trust that our God brings good out of all things. And as we take communion today, let's remember the man who trusted in God's plan with such intensity that he sacrificed his body and his blood to allow all of us into the most trustworthy relationship of all, a relationship with our Creator.
church first service. You glad to be here today? Yeah. Really glad you're here. And uh, let's give it up for the most dangerous uh, worship band on the West Coast. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate you uh, helping and leading, leading us to the face of God. If you're watching online, we also thank you for joining us. Do you ever plan something? And then life interrupted it. You uh, had your goals, your objectives, your resources, everything in place. You're going to make things happen. And then everything is changed by circumstances. Yeah, I see a lot of heads going like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been talking about in this series, make things happen. Ditch the resolutions. Don't just set a few puny self-help uh, things, but while you're on this planet, why not change the landscape to be used by God? And uh, one of the things we've said is you got to figure out what really matters the most and focus, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on exertion toward what really matters. And then we talked about one of those things that the, the most important is worshiping God. Jesus said that God seeks those who worship him in spirit and truth, who really worship him. He's looking, he's seeking. Here's something I can do that God is looking for. Amen. Those who truly worship him. And that's, of course, our lifestyle, but it's also when we come together as a body where we truly worship him uninhibited. Then we said in our relationships is another way where we make an impact. That Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. Strength is the most important commandment, and all the commandments hang on that. But then secondly, he said the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Love people. That's where love God, love people came from. And so he said, we're better together. We were made to grow together, to accomplish stuff together. We need relationships. God wired us for that. And so we need to, if we're going to make things happen, think about start with those closest to us, and it goes out from there. So then today, well, what if you're worshiping God? You're attempting great things for God. You're making your relationships the most important. And then the bottom falls out of your plans. You hit the wall. The, the door is closed. Where there used to be a door, now there's a wall. You get the call. Someone walks out on you. Uh, all of the circumstances that you had in place, this incredible plan happens. What do you do? And the premise of this message is you get out of control. You get out of control. We humans have a problem with control. Some of us think we're in control, and if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you, and it's my way or the highway. We know what's right. Others of us follow the control of someone else other than God. It may be traditions or someone in our life, and we've got to make them happy or a denomination or whatever. Pick, fill in the blank, and it's all about control. And, oh, we can't mess it up. We can't change anything. Uh, you know, the seven last words of a dying church. We've never done it that way before. And so we were very rigid and we can't change and we can't be flexible. And the problem with that is when we hit the wall, it may be an opportunity with God. That's one of the things I'm learning about God. What I perceive as a wall may be an open door for opportunity if I'll get out of control. And uh, so what we're going to look at uh, today is that premise that... Um, when you're working towards all that God says is important and things aren't working like you, you want, God is still there. God's still God. And uh, there was a man who uh, fell off a cliff. He was actually playing Frisbee by a cliff, which isn't a good idea. And he went for the Frisbee. He tripped over the cliff. He saw a big root coming out of the wall. He grabbed a hold of it. And then he cried out to God, Oh, God, help me. And just then a motorboat appeared before, below where the, there was water. And the guy cries out, hey, the water's deep. Don't worry. Let go. You'll fall in the water. We'll scoop you up. And the guy looks up into the heavens. Oh, God, help me. And a helicopter hovered overhead. And they dropped down a ladder. And they said, take hold of the ladder. Let go. Let go. And the guy looks up into the heavens. Oh, God, help me. And a friend lowers a rope over the edge of the cliff. Let go, let go, take the rope, take the rope, let go. And he cries out into the heavens, oh God, help me. And God booms from heaven and says, I sent you a rowboat, I sent you a helicopter, I sent you a friend with a rope, what more do you want? Sometimes I think God gives me opportunities, but it's not the opportunities that I want or I expected or I planned and I miss out because I won't let go. 
but I got to get out of control. Number one, sometimes when you do attempt to make things happen for God, he lets you go to your wits end, to your wits end. Your wits is your sharpness, your mental sharpness. You can't perceive sometimes what you're supposed to do. You, God will let us, even us good, nice people trying to accomplish good things for him, he will, I just want to warn you, he'll let you get to your wits end sometimes. And uh, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 107. We're going to look at that together. We're going to look at the first 32 verses. It's kind of long, so I'm going to get you to help me out in some of it. If you look at it up here on the outline, uh, at first it begins out with giving thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. This may refer to captives who were taken into captivity, the Israelites, and then God redeemed them. And, and whether it's them or not, it applies to us too figuratively. We've been redeemed if we're in Christ. And he says, let them tell their story. Number, uh, verse 3, those he gathered from the lands from the east, the west, and north, and the south. Then the next verse says some, and you've got four sums that we're going to look at, okay? And we're going to see things maybe that we can relate to figuratively. We're going to see some things maybe we can relate to literally. Let's look at this first group of sums. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. These are the wanderers, not that song or the singer, but this is, this is those going from place to place, um, experience to experience, not blooming where planted, uh, just kind of going here, going there, going. Maybe some of us can uh, relate to that. We've been in a situation where we just feel like we're moving from one thing to we're so busy, and their lives ebbed away. There's a hunger, there's a thirst for something more. Well, look what they do. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could city, uh, settle. Excuse me. So they cried out to God, and God gave them a place to settle. God gave them a place to bloom. Now, let's read out loud, all of us together, verses 8 and 9. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Okay, next verse. Some, everybody say some. Here's another group. Some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Some of us can relate to this, sitting in darkness. These are people imprisoned. These are people suffering in chains because why? They rebelled against God's word. Some of us have figuratively been enslaved because we didn't follow God's word. Some of us have literally been enslaved because we did not follow God's word. But look what they do. They cry out to God, the Lord in their trouble, and he, what did he do? He saved them from their distress. Verse 14, he brought them out of the darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. I just want to say, some people still have to stay behind bars, but God sets them free inside. Verse 15, let them give thanks. Let's read 15 and 16 together. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron. One of the things Jesus said in his first message, he quoted from Isaiah, that he came to set the captives free. Let's go to verse 17. Some, everybody say some. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. Iniquity is another word for sin. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is not following God's law, which is perfect, or his commands, okay? So some uh, become foolish uh, because they were not following God's word. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord. Let's stop there for a second. They loathed food and drew near the gates of death. Maybe some of us can relate figuratively uh, or literally, uh, maybe spiritually or physically. 
going a lifestyle, rebelling against what we know is right, or we've been taught what is right, and we kind of just get a little foolish. We get a little foolish. And uh, after a while, things don't taste as good as they used to taste. There's something missing. Then they cried to the Lord, right? Uh, to, in, in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he what? He healed them. God heals physically. God heals spiritually. God heals emotionally. He rescued them from the grave. They were ready to die. They were ready to give up. And God healed them and gave them a new life. Uh, let's read 21 and 22 out loud together. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Verse 23. Everybody say psalm. psalm. I love this psalm. Psalm is the church builders. Psalm is the church planters. This psalm is the uh, disciples that follow Jesus, that want to make a difference, that want to impact the world, that want to be a part of the kingdom of God. Let's read about them. Some went out on the sea in the ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. If you, I'm just going to tell you, if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to really make the, an impact in the world, not just compartmentalize, have a little Jesus, but really try to live the, the life and to make an impact in the kingdom of God, there's going to be times you're at the highest highs and go, wow, this is awesome! And there's going to be times you go to the lowest depths. There's going to be times when you had everything figured out and circumstances changed all your plans and you are literally at your wit's end. But God is not gone. God hasn't left you. Look what they did. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided into them to their desired haven. Let's read 31 and 32 together. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. I just want to tell you, sometimes Amen. if we're not attempting anything for God, things may go really smooth for us. And sometimes when we are attempting great things and we want to make a difference, we're going to go through hell on earth. We're going to go through some heavy challenges. But God has not left you. You are not without God. And number two, times of uncertainty and difficulty teach us to rely on God. Times of uncertainty and difficulty teach us to rely on God. I have some quotes about circumstances uh, from some different writers. I just wanted to read these to you. One writer, James Allen, says, Circumstances do not make the man. They reveal him to himself. Sometimes we find out what we're made of, in other words, through difficulty. The next one says, whether you're winning or losing, it is important to always be yourself. You can't change because of the circumstances around you. That's Cotton Fitzsimmons. Uh, don't abandon yourself, is what the writer's saying. To try to change uh, to other people or abandon your core values or what, who, God made you to be you. He didn't mess up with you, you know. Be who you are, regardless of the circumstances. The next one, you are an extremely valuable, worthwhile, significant person, even though your present circumstances may have you feeling otherwise. James Newman, your value hasn't changed because of difficulty. God loves you. God created you in his image, and he cares about you. The next one says, we can let circumstances rule us, or we can take charge and rule our lives from within. And I, I believe that us as believers do that. When we trust God, we rely on God, even through difficult circumstances, we're not letting them rule us and take away our joy. They can, they can lower our happiness scale a little bit, but we can still have joy in our heart. We're securing God. Uh, it is not the situation that makes the man, it's the man who makes the situation, Frederick Robertson. In other words, the situation that I think is so terrible and horrible and a wall may be an opportunity that God has. 
Circumstances um, are the rulers of the weak. They are but the instruments of the wise, Samuel well wrote. Some can be destroyed by them and victims by them and complained by them and become bitter by them and others are somehow uh, freed through that and even make uh, them as opportunities. Events of great consequence often spring from trifling circumstances. I like this one because I see it in history. I see it in God's people, trifling uh, circumstances where people accomplish great things. I see it in our country. You know, some of you heard me talk about the American revolutionaries. It's not like they kept winning all these glorious battles when the revolution was going on. In fact, they were losing a lot of battles. In fact, they were freezing to death in the cold. They were wearing rags, and whoever had to stand guard, they would give a little extra rag so they wouldn't freeze to death. The fact is, some wanted to give up, but there were people like George Washington who said to, to bow his knee to God and said, we're not giving up. And they kept the truth of history as they kept losing battles till they won the war. Out of trifling circumstances can come great consequence. Hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances which we know to be desperate, G.K. Chesterton. I find that it is not the circumstances in which we are placed, but the spirit in which we face them that constitutes our comfort, Elizabeth King. And so I want to look at Paul's writing and something he said in Corinthians. I have it on your outline. He, I want to say the context. It's not on your outline. Before he says this, he says, Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction so that we can comfort others or those with the same comfort that we receive. He calls God the God of all comfort. And he says God will comfort us. And he says he doesn't want me to just get comforted. He wants me to be a reservoir of his blessings, doesn't he? To comfort others. Then he makes this statement that's on your outline. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure. Not just pressure. Great pressure. Far beyond our ability to endure. What were they doing? They're ministers. Come on, is it that hard? They're church planners. They're doing ministry. They're working for God. And God's letting them go under great pressure. Far beyond, not just beyond, far beyond the ability to endure. Have you ever felt that way? You're under great pressure. That's beyond your ability to endure. And you felt like giving up. That's what he says. So that we despaired of life itself. We despaired of life itself. We're ready to check out. Some of God's greatest workers, Moses, um, Elijah, they're like, God, take me out of here. I'm done. Please take me out. Maybe you felt that way. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But, everybody say but. but. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who does what? Raises, Raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him, on who? On him we have set our what? Hope that we he will continue to deliver us. So Paul says these extreme difficulties come to test us, to see if we'll rely on God, to teach us to rely on God, who raises the dead, and that he is our hope. If he can raise the dead, he can help us, and he can raise us. This week on Facebook, uh, this quote uh, from me saying something 14 months ago, I was so elated we had gotten the self-supported status as a church, which I hate that phrase because we got out of bed this morning because of God. Nothing, nothing is self-supported without God, but you know what I'm saying. We got to where we could cover it. We had people help us, and so I wrote a paragraph, because uh, a lot of people I talked to on Facebook helped us in the early stages, and, and, and then there's a lot of hope people, and, and about how thankful I am, blah, 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 and so all these nice people started saying stuff, and it resurfaced this week after 14 months, and I put a little update there, and then people were saying stuff about the church. One of great, us great the church is reaching out kind of stuff. And uh, then two of our people, Cherish, put, because um, hope is unstoppable. And then Carol Prince wrote, um, love God, love people, building relationships um, that last forever. In Christ, we always have hope. And I was like, looking at my phone going, yes! And that's what Paul is saying. On him, we have set our hope. We have this eternal hope that's beyond ourselves when we have God. 
And so, number three, when we understand who God is and trust the source of life, we understand we came from God, we're going back to God, he's in control, I'm not, he's sovereign. When we understand that and we trust in him through uncertainty, trials, persecution, and worries of this world, he, we live productive lives. I should say of this world. We live productive lives. He produces something good, and I believe that because of passages like the parable of the sower. There's other places. But in, in the parable of the sower, Jesus, it says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while other people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. Everybody say the path. The path. The path. So you have different kinds of soil that the seed is falling on. That's the first one. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places. Say rocky places. Rocky, rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly <laughs> because of the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns. Say thorns. Thorns, thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other fell on good soil. They say good soil. Good soil. That's the good stuff. Where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And now Jesus taught in parables a lot. He'd get people thinking. Some would understand. Some wouldn't understand. Sometimes he would explain to his disciples later. That's what he does here. So I put those verses down. Verse 18, he's explaining to them. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 100, 60, 30 times what was sown. We all produce different amount of fruit, but we all have to rely on the source of the giver of life. And we, uh, I think the soil refers to hearts. And you see the hearts of people who hear about the kingdom, and they don't quite understand. It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom that Jesus told the story about a man who was out in a field, and he found a pearl of great price. And he said, this pearl is greater than anything. I'm going to go sell everything I have so I can get this pearl of great price. He says, that's the kingdom. The kingdom is more important than anything I have or anything I own or anything I am. That's how awesome the kingdom is. But some people don't understand it. Yeah, church is nice. You know, church. I, I've tried religion. I always want to say I tried religion too. Who needs religion? You know, I want a relationship with the Creator of the universe and be in the kingdom of God that lasts forever and ever. But some don't don't understand it. Others, they're like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. This is exciting. And they become believers. But then hard times come. They received it with joy, but they trouble comes. People give them a hard time. Oh, you're a Christian, huh? Make fun of them. They're like, wait a minute, I thought this was all exciting. Everybody was all happy when I became a Christian. Now I'm going through these difficulties. Who needs this? Other people, you know, they, they're, they're excited. They become believers. They're in there. But then there's so much worries in this world. We forget that we're never going to get out of here alive. We fall in love with this world and all this stuff. And we all can get sucked up into it. We look at these boxes. They show us all this stuff. We read this news, and it's all about this stuff that's temporary. And pretty soon, the stuff that's going to burn the big bonfire becomes the main thing, and, and our lives ebb away. But others that have good fruit, they hear. They, they, keep, they keep trusting in the source. And they also go through trials. We all do. We all go through difficulties. But as we trust in him, we can be the good soil and continue to bear fruit. That's what Jesus is saying. The one we follow went through difficulty and uh, bears fruit every day through his followers. Sometimes I tell the roller coaster illustration from time to time, and I tell it to myself 
I try not to do it out loud when people are watching me, but I tell myself about, remind myself when I hit a wall or where there was a door is closed and I'm looking for it. And when I was a kid, we lived in Santa Cruz for a year and a half. We just played by that lighthouse there and at the beach there. And then we also would take our lunch money and we would go to the boardwalk and we'd take out this huge wooden roller coaster. Some of you have seen that, I'm sure. And uh, on the roller coaster, when I first started riding it, I noticed that I, besides it scaring the heck out of me, uh, people would raise their hands, you know? You, know how you, do? you go up to thing first, there's this big, when you first get on it, you go, t -t 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 -t. and then after you get to the very top, you go up to the guys, and yeah! And these people would be like this. I was like, how in the world did you do that? The first time I tried it, it's so scary, and I don't want to do it. Whoa! You know, you're locked in. You're locked in for the ride of your life, raising your hands. That's how it is with God. The only place this illustration breaks down is when you hear about amusement park losing a roller coaster off the tracks, okay? But it doesn't break down with God. God holds you in. God's got you. And I want to say to anyone right now that's maybe going through that part of the roller coaster or scared up here, you can raise your hands with God. God's got you. God cares about you. He's got you. He's eternal. And you can let go and trust in Him. See, the whole point of this lesson is our greatest need is God. That's our greatest need. It's not, it's not my agenda or my plans. It's not even good things like my spouse, uh, popularity, uh, relationships, a career. Uh, it's not the agenda I have. It's not admiration. It's not fame. It's not any of these things. My greatest need. See, sometimes you go, if I could just get this relationship, I could just get this job, if I could just do this event, then everything's going to be awesome. No, what I need is God. Not a little compartmentalized God, but God in my relationships, God in my career, God in my neighborhood, God in my home. That's my greatest need. And when you get that, and he lets you go through difficulty, you go, okay, I need you now. I need you now, God. I need you now. And I want you to know that. And, and me, and I'm not trying to talk down to you. I'm trying to encourage you and me to remember right now our greatest need is God. And you can say, I need you now. And he is there. Amen. You can go out of here with God right now today. No matter what you're going through, you can go out out of control from here on out. And I want to say a prayer. Let's pray together. As you're praying, you can pray with me. And maybe I know people in this this church family are going through some real heavy difficulty. Some of you extra share. Uh, those of you who don't feel like you're in difficulty have come through it or get ready. It's on the way. It's a part of this fallen world. And I, I, you can say this prayer with me. Father, help me to, to try to do my best to stay near to your heart, the heart of God, as I make my plans. So I plan things that matter the most because you teach me. But Lord, help me to remember that sometimes the plan doesn't work. And so help me to look for your opportunities and get out of control and stay near to your heart and to tempt things uh, that that uh, are near to your heart, that you care about. God, help me to remember there's not even a, such a thing as failure when I try for you. That failure is like fertilizer that makes things grow. If we learn from it and we rely on you, we don't fail. And Father, I, I pray for people in this room who I know are going through real challenges and difficulty, Lord. Help them to feel your presence. Help them, God. And if you'd like to, while we're praying, you can say with me right now these words, I need you now. I need you now, Lord. I'm out of control. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship God.